to the Natural Health Podcast, where we bring awareness of sustainable health in the business hustle space. Natural Health Podcast is perfect for the high-performing business-minded individuals who want to work with their biochemistry to achieve optimal health. It's Friday, which means it's time for friends sharing facts about health, business, and overall success. In today's episode, we talk to Dr. Andrew Timos, who will talk about pain management and the truth about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Andrew is a strength coach and osteopath who's passionate about strength and conditioning. Andrew has eight years experience in personal training, which led him to study biomedical and exercise science, which then further pushed him to complete his osteopathy degree. With all of his knowledge about the body, he's on a mission to teach us about strength and how to move our body without pain, which involves movement-based training. When he's not in the clinic or at the gym, he's mixing his tunes on his turn turntable as a DJ and playing the drums. Welcome to the Natural Health Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Did you like that little intro with the DJing and the drums? I did. I felt, I felt famous there for a second. <laughs> that's, it. That's, that's the whole point. I'm giving you a little spotlight right here. <laughs> yeah. So Andrew, with, you know, with being, you know, eight years experience as personal training, moving into osteopathy, being a DJ, um, playing the drums, loving movement. So what, what have been the key turning points in your journey to where you are now? Because you've moved a lot and you've done a lot in your life. Yeah. Well, well that's a tough question. Um, there's been a lot of turning points. Um, I think one of them was uh, back in 2012. So after high school, I did um, two years of TAFE. I studied a cert for and a diploma in sport development at NMIT. It's now called Melbourne Polytechnic. Um, but I never wanted to be an osteo. I always wanted to be a, um, a PE teacher. Oh, nice. Because I just, I love working with kids and, you know, like I enjoyed it. And at the time, I was actually a tennis coach as well. So I thought, you know, I could probably do this full time, I guess. Um, and then uh, as I started my degree, the biomedical and exercise science, I still had a, a passion for being a PE teacher. But then, I don't know, just as I started to learn more about the body, I just, I just started to change what I wanted to do. And then I started to, you know, talk to some other people. And then I wanted to be a physio. So I spent about a year and a half uh, during my exercise science degree trying to figure out how to get into physio and then it was just too hard it was too competitive and it was ridiculous and then um, I found out through a friend of mine uh, about this thing called osteopathy I've never heard of it before I'm like this I don't thing. know what that is <laughs> literally I'm just like I don't I don't know what, what is that so then I looked I looked more into it and then I'm like okay well this sounds kind of a bit like Cairo sounds a bit like physio it's kind of a mixture of everything I think that's what everyone thinks when they first hear it. When people at first hear osteopathy, they think, oh, so you study bones? Yeah. Or it's, oh, so you're, or you're a mixture of osteo, uh, you're a mixture of chiro and physio and all that. I'm just like, yeah, all right, let's just say that. Yeah. Let's just say that. Just to keep it simple. Um, so, yeah, so at the time, a friend of mine told me about it. I looked into it. And because of all my, uh, all my previous studies, I was actually able to get credited a year. So they had what they call a bridging course. So the osteopathy degree is a five-year degree. It's, long, it's a long time. Mm, mm. So I was able to get credited uh, many subjects. I think it was like seven subjects. So I was able to combine first and second year together. And then they, that enabled me to uh, finish the course a lot quicker. So that was pretty good. I was pretty happy with that. Um, but yeah, but in terms of the turning points, I just think learning more about the body um, at the start of my sort of first degree, that kind of helped me decide, okay, well, this is what I want to do. And then obviously learning more about the body in terms of strength training and movement and just working with people. I'm just like, no, I think this is what I want to do. Yeah. And I mean, it's been set up for you working, you know, working about the body, being a PT, then being like a um, tennis teacher, like you said, and then moving into wanting to be, um, you know, learning more about the body. It's just a path to go to osteopathy, isn't it? It's just perfectly made for you. 100%, 100%. As just as far as like one thing, one thing just kind of led on to the next, even though it took a long time. Like I was telling you before, I spent yeah. nine years after high school studying, even though it took a long time, I could kind of see how everything just kind of like was setting up for the next thing. Yeah. It was all just um, meant to be, it was like, boom, boom, do this. And then you end up here. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And now I can safely say like, I'm pretty content with what I'm doing. Like I'm actually like enjoying it. 
That's amazing. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. And like, I can see, um, you know, from watching you on Instagram and talking to you, I can see that you're always learning. You're always learning. Yes, always. you stop studying, but you're still always learning. Always. I try to, I try to read something like a topic, whatever, like at least, every day for at least 90 minutes to two hours. It may not be straight. Like sometimes I'll read, I'll read in between patients. Um, but I always try to keep the mind stimulated because you can't, it's, this is one of those fields where you can't, and you know yourself being a naturopath, you can't just stop going over the stuff that you've learned because someone can just walk in the door with anything and you're just like, I've got no idea. I've completely forgotten what this is. Or they're like, <laughs> I'm taking this supplement. I'm taking this herb. I'm taking this. And you're just like, oh, uh, I've forgotten what that is. Or they're like, I've got this condition. You're like, oh. you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So you're always going over stuff. You're always learning. Even with the um, like seminars that we do, like I do as many as I can. Um, I still try to prioritize. It's still very important to prioritize. Yeah. You know what I, mean? I think that's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. I think it's really important to have someone, you know, like an amazing osteopath that actually keeps educating themselves and keeps learning because every treatment then is going to be different. Okay, the first treatment yep. is this and then you're always evolving. You're not just always doing the same thing. 100%. 100%. Amazing. So I can say, like, I can see that you're pretty successful. Um, and in this podcast, we talk about success and what, how it means different things to different individuals. Um, before we go into deeper about our topic today, which is going to be so interesting, I'm so excited. I wanted to know what does success look like to Andrew? You know, I was having this conversation the other day with one of my clients, actually. Um, see, to me, success is growing both personally and professionally you know some people like to have the fancy cars the fancy house the gucci bag the versace wash whatever you want to call that stuff right i'm not i'm not about that i don't i don't care about that i'm all about growing both personally and professionally personally like just becoming just a better person whether it's helping people out helping other people grow or professionally just you know trying to grow my business you know trying to educate people or, you know, like trying to get people through the door to help them improve their life. That's what I'm all about. So that's, that's, that's what success means to me. Beautiful. So growing mm. personally and professionally, growing every day. Yeah. And I mean, that's all you're about. Yeah. I mean, being to uni for so long and then still learning every day. And that's absolutely amazing. So that is success. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that. So let's okay. get into today's absolutely amazing topic. So let's talk about non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. I mean, mm. the hidden truth behind them, you know, mm. I'm sure we've all taken them in the past or, you know, some people might be taking them right now. But little do we know what they're actually doing to our body. So you know what, Andrew, let's educate the public. What are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs? Let's get into it. So you, well, you just said it, non-steroidal non <laughs> anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, they're non-steroidal <laughs> anti-inflammatory drugs. They're, they're very good at um, reducing inflammation and providing an analgesic effect. So just like mm. pain. They're very good, good at reducing pain. Um, I think the problem is people don't actually know the long-term effects of taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Short-term, it may be good just for like reducing like any severe pain that the person may be experiencing. Like for example, a classic example is, let's just say you hurt your knee really bad. Actually, you know what? I'll give you an example of mine. So about a year ago, I... Um, I hyperextended my knee and it was really, really bad. Ouch. So for a couple of days there, just to manage the pain, I had to take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So I was taking Voltaren for a couple of days with the, with the idea and the intent to just try help reduce inflammation and reduce pain to avoid excessive tissue damage. So there's a, there's a, there's a reason why people take it and I think it's when you take it is important. See, some people, what the thing is, they rely, they rely on it all the time. If they've got pain, any sort of pain, oh, it's okay, I'll just take a Panadol. Oh, it's okay, I'll just take a Nurofen. That's fine, it'll do. But they're not addressing the cause of the pain. They're just, it's like a Band-Aid, it's temporary relief. You know what I mean? Mm. But for acute things, like I just gave you my my um, little episode there with my knee, mm. they can work really good. Mm. So, so why there's would, a time and place. 
Yeah. So why, what would be the most, why would people take, why would people take them? Well, again, I just, I think the most common reason why people take it is just because they want to just get out of pain and yes. just to, you know, get on with their daily routine and just not be, you know, like stressed out because they've got work and they've got this pain and then they've got to go out and do something else and they're going to probably be in more pain. People don't want to be in pain. People want to walk around and do their daily activities with no pain. Um, and there's so much evidence coming out now with pain science in terms of like how like living with pain and what it can actually do to the body in terms of change how we perceive pain. Um, it's a very, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's becoming a big part of education and science. Like we're yeah. starting to really understand how things work now. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that example is absolutely amazing. So, you know, you can use these for short term. And, ex- mm. and, and like when you look at the actual instructions, that's actually what they're intended for. And yeah. it actually says in the instructions, I think it says about 10 days. If you're using them more than 10 days, you should go see a doctor and actually yeah. further discuss it while you're taking it. It actually says that if someone looks at their own um, prescription and so forth. So it is made to be used short term, exactly what you said. So in regards to you know, so short term. So what do they do short term in your body and what do they do long term in your body? So short term, so as you know, so when we get inflammation in the body or more so like, yeah, just like in a joint, for example, we get an increase of um, like your pro-inflammatory prostaglandins. So the most common ones, (coughs) excuse me, the most common ones you hear about are your you know, your COX-1, COX-2, your 5 LOX. So these are all you know, COX for short. So it's like cy- cyclooxygenase. That's the long name for it. Um, these are pro-inflammatory prostaglandins. So if these are around a joint, especially with inflammation for a long period of time, these can actually cause more tissue damage, especially COX-2 and 5 LOX. So the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs they're designed to remove all those pro-inflammatory cytokines out of the joint just to help prevent excessive tissue damage. That's really, that's kind of the intent for how they work. And then when you, when you go down the path of like, so your Voltarins are generally stronger than your Nurofens, but then Panadols are not actually an anti-inflammatory drug. They're, they work differently. They work, they work more, just to help reduce pain. They don't actually tackle inflammation. That's kind of, that's the kind of really basic explanation I can give to like how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially they, like you said, they inhibit those enzymes to work. So essentially that's in the short term, right? But what effect would that have if you, you know, for example, Bob down the road hurts his back and then he keeps taking neurofern. He takes it initially acutely for a few days. And then, you know what? His back pain is just so bad. He takes it on a regular basis. He pops about two, three a day for, let's say, six months, or even a year. Is that okay? Like, what does that do to the body? What would Bob do? No, I can go down many paths with that question. <laughs> many paths with that question. Do you have, do you have four hours? <laughs> Um, all right, let's go down the gut health pathway. So, okay. as you know, um, there's a little condition called leaky gut syndrome. So there's a lot of evidence to show now that with excessive long-term use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that it can actually damage our intestinal wall and it can cause leaky gut. Um, and there's also some evidence to actually show that. So we have what they call uh, it's PGE2 in the gut, and this can help maintain gut integrity. And the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, after a long period of time, it can damage and remove those. So it pretty much just makes our intestinal wall a lot weaker. And if that happens, then um, we get, just to keep it in layman's terms, the intestinal wall, it starts to kind of have these little gaps into it. Mm-hmm. And then that's what, then we get uh, leaky gut syndrome. So then what happens is we develop, they call it type three immunity, where we actually get, uh, we develop um, like an allergy to protein because the pathogens kind of leak out of the intestine. And then we just develop this, allergy to protein and that causes inflama- excessive inflammation in the gut and causes le- leaky gut. Um, 
and we also get uh, we don't have so in the intestine we get what they call proliferation and differentiation of cells so because there's so much inflammation the cells in our gut are consistently dying and the rate of repair is not meeting the rate of recovery so this is another way that we can it, we can get inflammation in the gut so there's two ways two main ways that they talk about when it comes to kind of you know like irritable bowel syndrome leaky gut that's those are some of some of the ways that i've been learning about and what, what they've been really talking about i don't know mm. if you've heard any other mm. any mm. other mm. ways that can cause leaky gut i think that's absolutely absolutely amazing and the thing is is this guy bob right that hurt his mm. back and he's taking mm. these these um drugs he wouldn't have an idea because then in a few months he might be like oh i'm getting i'm getting this rash or i'm getting these um burping i'm getting this bloating i'm getting all of this and he would not link it to his back pain he would not link it to yeah. the drugs that you're taking and in, in addition to what you said with all the gut stuff it's absolutely amazing that you link that but there's so much depletion that these drugs also do with minerals and vitamins they deplete yeah. our vitamin c there goes our collagen production there goes our repair yeah. especially like you said with the knee you need you need your vitamin C. You need your collagen to repair. You need your tissue to repair. Um, so it's absolutely amazing that you actually link that to gut health. And not not a lot of people mm. would think that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm very big on gut health. Um, I th it's a very very important part of the human body. They, I think they call it the second brain. Like our gut is a second brain because yes. our gut influences many things. And there's so much evidence to show that long-term like autoimmune diseases and others other other systemic conditions are linked to gut health mm. and it's like well if we can tackle that early on then we can potentially prevent all these diseases from happening long term but then if we talk about bob <laughs> all right if we, talk, if we talk about bob um let's just say for example he's just popping these pills like m&ms mm. for six weeks Mm. or even longer maybe we'll say 12 weeks okay so after 12 weeks if he's suffering back let's we'll say back pain right if he's suffering back pain after 12 weeks it then becomes chronic back pain because of the period of time okay now the problem with chronic pain is the fact that our body starts to perceive pain differently than someone with acute pain so for example, uh, to go a little bit scientifically, so like our pain threshold begins to change when someone goes more into that chronic pain sort of category. Um, and this has got to do a lot with our C fibers and our A delta fibers. So these are our pain sort of fibers in the nerve. And it's been shown that people with chronic lower back pain, their, their ability to tolerate pain changes because the threshold isn't as high. So for example, let's just say you've got chronic pain and I don't, let's just say you've got chronic lower back pain mm -hmm. and I don't have chronic lower back pain. All right. If I, oh, sorry, I've got slight back pain and you've got chronic lower back pain, mm -hmm. right? If I go to pick something up, Okay, it's the same thing. Let's just say I'm picking something up that's 40 kilos, right? I know that's going to hurt my back. I'm going to pick it up. But this is going to hurt your back even more mm. because of how the brain is changing our perception of the pain. Because this person has been living in pain for so long, their ability to kind of not tolerate it, but like perceive it is just changing. So that's why... That's another reason why having long-term use of non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs as your primary therapy, let's just say, is not a good thing. The idea is to tackle it from a different perspective so you don't go down that chronic pain path because we don't, because chronic pain, chronic pain is not a normal part of life. We, we, mm. No one should be living in pain. No one should be living in pain. And there's so many people, there's so many people who live in pain all day. I can probably name you three people I know in my life who are living in pain every day and they can't imagine their day with no pain. Wow. It's pretty bad. Yeah.
Wow. So, so what is pain on a simple term? So for the audience who's listening, um, how would you describe pain in a simple, simple term? That's the thing. People think pain is a bad thing. Pain is not a bad thing. You know what I mean? Pain doesn't mean tissue damage. Everyone thinks, oh, I'm in pain. There's something going on here. Like there's, you know, something's damaged. Doesn't, that doesn't mean, you know, there's something damaged. It's just pain is just like, it's like telling you, hey, man, there's something going on here. Like, can we like figure it out or what? Like, for example, let's say we've got knee pain. Let's say we've got patella tendinopathy. So the patella tendon, it sits under the patella, a very common injury. Patella tendinopathy is associated quite often with weak glutes, right? So instead of popping urofen like Skittles, right? How about you go to your manual therapist or your strength and conditioning coach who knows about biomechanics and we address the cause. We don't just mask the problem. You mm. know what I mean? Mm, so mm. potentially, potentially, I'm not saying this is the case, but it's, it's the case in the majority of the time. Potentially, this person could have a weak glute, especially like a glute medius. So, and quite often, individuals with patellar tendinopathy, you will find that their biomechanics in the, in, on that hip also changes. So you'll find that the hip flexors are actually a little bit tighter on that side and the lower back is a little bit tighter on that side. For some people, not all. Hmm. So addressing those issues and strengthening certain muscle groups as well as the patella tendon could increase their ability to move around in their daily routine with no pain. So they could get better and then not fall into that category of chronic pain and rely on taking pain meds just to mask the pain. Wow. So pain doesn't mean damage. Pain means there's something going on here. Let's try and address it. And this is a conversation I have with a lot of my patients. I say to them, well, for example, after they train, I'm like, don't think just because you're sore after training or something feels sore that there's something wrong. I go, even if, like, even if you've got joint pain from squatting, that's okay. That's fine. That just means like there's, there's, you know, you've done some, we'll say micro tears. There's some micro tears happening in there, in there, but your body is working on repairing it. Like you have to, you have to understand. It's important to understand the difference between like exercise related pain and damage pain. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a difference between both of them. Mm, and I mm. think, and once my patients kind of understand that, like I had one a couple of weeks ago and I gave her this speech and then the next week she came back, she's like, you know what? I could actually feel the difference and how I perceived it was completely different. Wow. She had, she had the same exercise routine, but because of how she perceived the pain, which she was completely different. That's absolutely amazing. And, and what you said about like the knee, the knee issue, who would think squats or working on your gluteus would actually help? Like that is absolutely crazy. People would be like, well, it's knee pain. Like let's address the knee. Like there's an issue with the knee. And like you said, it's all connected. Like our whole body is connected. And I get that a lot too. Like um, when I train and stuff like that, I get weird pain sometimes and I'm like, oh, it'll just go away. And like you said, in a few days, it does go away and it doesn't come back and it's somewhere else. And that's because, like you said, you're actually tearing a bit and it's repairing because your yep. body is made to repair itself. You don't, yep. if it works at optimal level. It's made to repair itself and it's made to help you. And by saying, hey, buddy, there's a little bit of pain here. Let's, like the actual pain, it's kind of saying, help me out, address it. Let's eat healthy. Let's do the right movement. Let's get adjusted. Yeah. Let's do the right yeah. things. So you can help me repair because our body is just there to help us. It's not there to, to hurt us. Exactly right. hundred percent, hundred percent. And there's people I know now, like, like we know, for example, strength training. So strength training is a very, very big part of longevity. You know what I mean? Like just going to get an osteo treatment or chiro treatment. Yeah, it's going to help. It's going to help in a massive way. It's going to get you moving better. You're going to be feeling great, whatever. But people need to understand it's only temporary relief, especially like, you know, for example, if you're going to be sitting at a desk, right? Let's say you've got neck pain. If you're going to be sitting at a desk all day, go to see your osteo. They work on you. You walk out. You feel great. 
and then you got to go back to the desk sitting in the same spot and not do any movements that's going to help strengthen the muscles that's the, that are weaker and that's causing you to move in that, into that position, well, then you're going to end up back to the osteo the next week. Now, some people want to do that. Some people want to go to the osteo every week or the car every week just to get just, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that because mm-hmm. there we get great results like that. But in terms of longevity, strength training and resistance training and allowing our tissues to tolerate load in certain position, that is how we can prevent pain from coming on long-term. So, so you spoke about strength training. What is it? Mm-hmm. Like Some people might be like, okay, you're talking about strength training, but what, what is it? Is it running? Is it squatting? Strength is it power lifting? Yeah. The power lifting 300 kilos. That's strength training. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, strength training, anything, anything that's adding uh, additional resistance to our body. So... I wouldn't probably so I wouldn't probably say running or that I wouldn't call that strength training. I'd probably say things that are more yeah, just additional load. So like doing like a bench press or doing squats or doing chin ups or something like that. Mm. Something that's additional. Additional it's gonna apply high external stimulus to our mm-hmm. body. Mm-hmm. I'd say that's more strength training. And a lot of people from my experience are scared of strength training. Hmm. Yeah, I, I I understand what you're saying. Uh, uh, it's a big, it's a big thing again. Not and not to you know point my finger at one gender, but the females especially. A lot of them are afraid to yes. lift weights because they think, oh, I don't want to get big and bulky and this and that. But um, you know, they don't. It's science. I'm just talking science here. They don't have, they don't have the physiology to get as big as males. A hundred percent. And that's where the misunderstanding is. And I talk about that. I preach that all the time. Yes. A hundred percent. Like females, females can lift. Like for example, I know, I know some on Instagram, I was watching it a couple of days ago. This couple, she was lifting 150, she was deadlifting 150 kilos and he was deadlifting 150 kilos and he was big and bulky and she was just like a normal size. Like she wasn't overly big. She wasn't skinny. She was just average. That's what I mean. Like, you know, you, just because you're lifting heavy stuff, it doesn't mean you're going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes, yes. You know I mean? And like you said, muscles are directly linked to longevity. So if your goal is to ling- live longer and healthier, that is mm-hmm. that should be part of your routine. And yeah. not just to live longer, but live pain-free. 100%. Even when it comes to stuff like, for example, osteoarthritis, okay? We've talked about, we've talked about osteoarthritis, Okay. It's termed as a degenerative condition of the cartilage, right? There's also some evidence to show that there's actually an inflammatory component to osteoarthritis, which makes sense because of your pro-inflammatory prostaglandins and all that stuff that occurs in the joint. So the first therapy that's been prescribed to people with osteoarthritis is water aerobics. So things that are non-weight bearing. And in terms of like medicine, um, like your omega-3 fish oils um, and your glucosamine and your chondroitin, those are your, your first line therapies, okay? But with more evidence now, so if you think about the cartilage, okay? So like, let's, let's talk about the cartilage of the knee, for example, okay? Let me tell you something. Let me, let me ask you a question, Mike. Do you think power lifters and elite weight lifters or just anybody who's lifting a lot of weight in their twenties. Okay. If cartilage was a degenerative condition, do you think we'll be able to walk after the age of 30? Probably not. If, if it was named that, and if it was mm. that, then probably not. We're wear and hard. tear. So yeah. wear and tear. <laughs> I'm doing quotation marks just for our listeners. Wear and tear. Okay. No way. If osteoarthritis was a wear and tear degenerative condition of the fibrocartilage of the knee, so the meniscus, as well as the articular cartilage, then we will be advised to sit in a chair and not move. I reckon we, everyone will be on those, what are those things called? The you know, scooter how, how, things. Yeah. Every, no, no one will be walking. People will be riding around on scooters all day. You know what I mean? 
So our body adapts to load. Our body tissues adapt to load, okay? And when you apply the appropriate stimulus to a load, then our body acts accordingly to help repair it. Not only that, we need the appropriate nutrients. So we've spoken about collagen before, okay? And there's a lot of studies to show now that, or this one in particular, that collagen can have chondroprotective properties as well as anti-apoptotic properties. So when we go back to the chondroprotective, so there's this particular study showed that the collagen helped actually regenerate cartilage in mild to moderate osteoarthritis patients. And they weren't active. And I think it was on like a 12 to 14 week trial. So it wasn't very long. That's amazing. And that's because it acts directly on the chondrocytes of mm. the cartilage, which helps regeneration. Mm. But in addition to that, you don't want to get to that stage. And how you don't get to that stage is you lift weights, you that's squat, it. you deadlift, you run. Running is great for the cartilage. People think, oh, running's bad for your knees. No, it's not. It's amazing for your knees. It yeah. helps the cartilage. And you said it right here. You heard it right here. Yeah. Running it is helps good. The, it's good for your knees. It's good for your back. It's good for everything. It maintains cartilage integrity. Mm. The only time you might, you might, like there's a, there's a common link with food, like obesity, for example. So there's mm. a link between obesity and osteoarthritis of the knee. And there can be a couple of reasons for that. But there's more evidence to show that it's not actually a weight bearing issue. It's more of an inflammatory issue. I was going to say, there's so many different links to it. Yeah. And exercise and it's just, it's kind of like, if you think, should I sit on this couch or should I exercise? The answer is exercise. I mean, look, talk to your professionals if you have some type of, you know, um, individual cases and things like that. But for the average Bob, if if you're sitting on a couch or if you go exercise, the answer is exercise. Always, always. So you, you've, spoken, you've spoken about a few things that you can do to reduce pain, such as nutrients. You've spoken about strength mm-hmm. training. Um, yeah. So what else would you recommend or would you, would you advise for individuals to do if they have pain? What's, what's the 101 for pain? So number one, well, okay, okay. It depends, it depends on what stage they are in their pain. It depends what's, what's going on. Beautiful. Okay. Look, look, I've, I'm not afraid to admit I've advised patients to take a nice steroid anti-inflammatory drug a few times, but that just depends on what's happening in their life because everyone's different. Individualized, the with, yeah. Yeah. The problem with the education system, I'm learning this very quickly and talking to my boss, I'm learning this very quickly, right? They don't, like, there's so many different cases that can walk through that door. Every person needs a different approach, right? But the problem with the education system is this is what you do. Dot points. Do this step, one step, two step, three step. Protocol, four. yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so, again, it depends on what stage they are. If it's an acute stage, okay, and they're quite sore, quite inflamed, like a couple of days, I would advise take this anti-inflammatory See how it goes, see how you feel. Because the goal is to get them out of pain early so then they can live their daily routine and then start rehab. So early stage, we're looking at manual therapy and we're looking at pain reduction. And then as the, as the days and weeks progress, once they kind of get out of pain or, ex, or severe pain, I should say, because you can still get good results even with mild to moderate pain while doing resistance exercise as the days progress and you feel good then we start implementing uh, resistance exercise to help strengthen certain tissues in certain areas and doing that with manual therapy that's most likely the best way to help reduce long-term pain it's not one or the other there's so many people who just think not manual therapy only there's many others who think no resistance training only manual therapy doesn't work. I know plenty of osteos who think manual therapy is a waste of time. I'm just like, what are you talking about, mate? Mm, 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 mm. Everything has a purpose. Implement all options, nutrition, exercise, and manual therapy. They've all got a place. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I love that because I remember last year I tore my ligament 
um, whilst fencing and it was really painful. I could hardly walk on it. And, you know, me being a naturopath, I'm like, when it's on you, you just, everything goes out the window. You're like, I have no idea what to do. So I contacted a few people that I know in the field, um, especially also a um, contacted a personal trainer. That's one of the first people that I contacted. And I was like, what do I do? And then I contacted an osteopath and then I contacted another naturopath. So like you said, I got, I got, like, I know it was minor and, you know, it was a minor ligament tear. I contacted all these individuals from their point of view to understand what to do. And then I implemented it. So what I did is, you know, took herbal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, herbs, nice. took, yep. um, took them every day on a high basis included all the minerals and the foods and the vitamins to ensure that my cartilage, my ligaments, everything was healing. The tissue was repairing itself. But then like on the second day, my PT and my osteo were like, you got to move. And I was like, I'm not going to move. Yeah. I've, I've hurt myself. I like, I need to just sit here and not do anything. And they're like, no, you have to move. So I made myself move every day. Even if it was like a little bit, a little bit, I moved, I moved, I moved around. I did the exercises. So what you said right there is absolutely amazing because you incorporate the best of everything you take whatever yep. best of everything. It's not just me being a naturopath. I'm not just about, no, I'm just taking my herbs and that's going to help it heal. No, I understand yep. that it's a body and I understand that it needs um, the personal training. I understand that it needs the osteopathy. I understand it needs this, that. So that's brilliant. I absolutely love your answer to that. And anyone who is out there in pain or does get into pain in the future i hope not but now you know kind of like what to do where to start off like where do i start off so i don't get into that chronic pain 100 percent. i was just going to read you yeah. something quickly yeah, because um so what, what, what you just said about that the movement and that that's 100 percent. so there's a couple different things that manual therapists or just health practitioners like to use so rice you ever heard of rice yes i have rice versus meat all right, so rice, okay. rest, ice, compression, elevation, and then meat, movement, exercise, analgesia, and treatment. I love so it. these are so both of these methods work, okay. But like I said to you, like one, not one method is the right one. You need to implement a method that is tailored to the person. You could you could recover better from something than me, and you could you may not even need your ice, your anti-inflammatories, you just may need certain things to help, you know, imp implement movement just to get things strengthening. Whereas someone like me, I may need, you know, the full nine yards, rest, elevation. I might need to go the whole way. You know what I mean? Like everyone's different. Everyone responds different. Everyone's lifestyle factors are different. hundred percent. And don't judge yourself. Yeah. No, nah, but having the knowledge on not having these like Voltarans and Eurofins, like M&Ms, then that's the way we can improve our lifestyle and not get into the category of chronic pain because no one wants to be in that category. Mm -hmm. And it's an ongoing circle. It just goes and goes yeah. and you take more and you get more pain yeah. and get more. And like you said, spoke about the threshold, that changes. It's an ongoing circle. Yeah. Look, yeah. I think the information that we shared with our audience today is absolutely amazing. They're going to get so much out of this. And if yeah, there are absolutely. individuals with pains, I'm pretty sure they'll be able to know, know kind of where to start off and what to do to get further information. So on this podcast, um, I ask everyone that I interview, um, mm -hmm. what is your best cap natural health hack? Oh, that's a hard question. I know. <laughs> Nat natural health hack. Yeah, yeah. So some people have spoken about cold showers. Other people have spoken about certain smoothies. Someone's spoken about just breathing. So, yeah. Are you talking about like recovery, like something in terms of recovery and help and help the body heal? Are you talking about that sort of, that sort of stuff? You can do that or something that you do every day that gets you to be at optimal level. Okay. I'm going to tell you what I think is a big part of recovery that has been lacking the past three months because of the coronavirus. And that is saunas, steam rooms, spas, and cold pools. So hydrotherapy, right? Let me tell you something that is probably one of the, or I've noticed that is probably one of the biggest components to exercise recovery. I think it's very underrated. Or it's, it's underrated. Sorry. It's underrated in the general public. And I, people, I say to people, you should go to the sauna, steam room once a week, minimum. Mm. Oh, yeah, man, haven't got time. You know, I'd love to go, I haven't got time. They'll probably go once a month, right? But, mm. but based on the theory and based on the mechanism, so heat 
Heat's fantastic, right? We get vasodilation, so increased size of blood vessels. We get more nutrients to the muscle. We help remove any byproducts that could potentially cause further tissue damage. Like, it's excellent. And I have really noticed a difference in terms of my recovery not going. I'm a lot more sore. Um, mm, mm. Whereas when I was going twice a week, so I'd actually bring a tension ball with me into the sauna and I'd roll out in the sauna. Nice. And I'd stretch in the sauna. Um, I jump in a cold pool, then I jump into the, the hot spa. And there's there's a lot there's there's more evidence to show like that hot cold hot cold coming out. It was Dr. Rhonda Patrick. She was talking about it. Yes, it does yes, something. Was. Yeah, it does something to our nerve endings. Can't remember exactly what it was. You may have to remind me on that a bit later. Yes, but it yes. just our our ability to recover from certain stimuluses from exercise is just it's ridiculous and it's underrated. And the general public, if they implement that into their weekly routine, they may notice a big difference in terms of how they recover from exercise. Not only that, it's it's very good for sleep. Like going to the sauna, I sleep like a baby. 100%. And that's, that's definitely something that I miss. And sauna use has so much scientific evidence backing us up. I mean, they've used it for hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, they're not wrong if they used it for so long and there's so much benefits to it. That's an absolutely amazing health hack. Um, and I can't wait to get to the sauna. I can't wait for that to reopen yeah, and get too. into it. <laughs> me too. So, Andrew, thank you so much for this amazing podcast. I really, really appreciate it. So we've come to the end of this magical podcast interview. For the listeners who want to know more about you, they're like, wow, this guy's amazing. He gets me. He understands pain. Um, you know, I really want to go see him as a strength coach. I really want to go see him as an osteopath or even both, even better. Where can they find you? So on Instagram, you can find me take control underscore osteo. Um, Facebook, it's take control P E R F. That's the, that's the link. Um, I've also got a website, take control performance.com. Um, you can find like links to, uh, the gym that I work at. You can, you can uh, have a look at some testimonials from my personal training clients. Um, you can, you can read my bio. I've got some some stuff about me on there. I've also got some blogs posts on there as well. Um, in terms of my personal training, so you can find me at Noble HQ, uh, Two of Oak Street, Brunswick, um, and osteopathy. You can find me at Elite Chiropractic in Essendon. Uh, that's thirty one A Kilo Road, Essendon North. That's Beautiful. where you can find me. And I think um, the benefit that this audience will get is if you follow him on Instagram, the information he provides on his posts is unbelievable. The stuff that he gives you out there for free is just extraordinary. You will not get this information from anyone. You'll have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars yep. to get all this information. <laughs> And you giving that away for free is the biggest thing that you can do. I mean, you're there to educate individuals. You, What you want is for them to get better, which I 100%. absolutely love. I absolutely love that. 100%. I'm all, I'm, all about, I'm all about educating people and I want them, that's in just helping them understand how to perceive things differently, especially when it comes to strength training. It's not bad for you. It's very good for you. <laughs> to very end good on for that you. note. <laughs> to end it on that note. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Thank you so much, Andrew. No worries. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us at the Natural Health Podcast. And remember, the missing link between failure and success is your health.